Canadian-born Paul Jay is an anti-establishment media titan, a Gemini award-winning documentary filmmaker. He spent five years as the chair of the Hot Docs Canadian International Documentary Film Festival, but is probably best known for his work in news media. He was executive producer of Counterspin, a CBC program debating the news of the day. He founded the Real News Network and spent 10 years as its CEO. He was an executive producer on The Empire Files with Tell the Sir, and currently he is the founding CEO and host of the analysis.news, doing in-depth interviews of political analysis. When Julian Assange was dragged by the police from the Ecuadorian embassy, he was clutching a book by Paul Jay and Gore Vidal. At the heart of his work is a refusal to accept McCarthyist framings that take capitalism and imperialism for granted, and an insistence on giving coverage to the alternatives. Paul Jay, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Uh, thank you, but the, the uh, use of the word Titan is highly exaggerated. <laughs> Go on. Well, uh, I'd like to begin. And as by... far as mainstream media in Canada is concerned at this time, I don't know that I exist, never mind being a Titan. <laughs> Go on. Well, uh, we'll jump on in and we'll talk a little bit about the contrast between your work and some of the stuff that might be considered mainstream in some ways, uh, which I think is, is for me, a very inspiring contrast. Um, but let's begin by how you get into it, because you actually don't start by jumping right into becoming a filmmaker and getting into news media. Can you talk a little bit about what you were doing before you found yourself in that career and how that path carved its way for you? Uh, it, it was really accidental i kind of stumbled from one thing to another uh, i always i guess had a, a desire uh to change the world uh and as i got into late teens and i found the more i listened to that voice uh, about living a life with meaning uh the happier i was uh, and that if i kind of just diverted from that uh i wasn't so it, it, the idea of living a, a more meaningful life, which for me meant, you know, fighting to change the world for the better. I mean, it sounds kind of vacuous, but it was more specific. It was uh, I grew up and became politicized during the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, when I was 12 or 13. I remember the you know, there's Bay of Pigs and I thought the world would come to an end, the assassination of Kennedy. And so I grew up at a time and uh, which was uh, impossible to, uh, I mean, I guess a lot of people did, but to be in denial of the uh, effect world events had on our lives, it was very personal. And I grew up in a fairly political household. So, you know, I was reading uh, newspapers as soon, uh, you know, when I could read, I think when I was about seven or eight, I wrote a letter to uh, uh, Prime Minister Diefenbaker because I'd read in the newspaper about a famine amongst the Inuit in the, in the, at those days called Eskimos. And there were hundreds, maybe even thousands of people dying of, of starvation. And I wrote Diefenbaker a letter saying, why, why aren't you doing something about this? And uh, I got a letter back from some hack saying, uh, Prime Minister is very uh, happy you're concerned and be assured the Canadian government is doing everything necessary. And if you want to, you should go donate to your local church. Uh, in some ways, that was a bit of a radical beginning of a radicalizing process for me, because whatever age I was, I, I thought that was bullshit. So, <laughs> uh, but then I, you know, as I got older and uh, I, I, I took the threat of nuclear war very seriously. Mm. And I was bored to death with school. I kind of hated it. And, and also, I never thought I'd live to see uh, being 20, 21 years old. And so I quit school when I was uh, legally able to at 16. Mm. And, and I went to an experimental school for a little while, but not, not, nothing serious. So, I, so I, I, I didn't go to university because I thought the world was coming to an end. And so I, I drove a truck for the post office for three years. I was a carbon mechanic on the railroad for five years and got involved in, in trade union politics. Uh, and anyway, and I was around the whole anti-war political movement. I, I started to learn more uh, about history. Uh, it was remarkable to me uh, how little I knew about real history. Uh, both in terms of the creation and formation of Canada or US uh, and you know so 
you know, obviously it's a long story, but in short, um, I, I, at this experimental school, somebody gave a camera, vol donated a camera. I made a little film, got interested in filmmaking and eventually got into, uh, back making documentary films. It's very interesting. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but, um, do you see parallels between, for instance, now I know a lot of people are not having kids because they feel like with the threat of climate change, uh, and of course now recently the, the amped up threat of nuclear war, which was always maybe a little more present than we thought it was. Um, but do you see par parallels between people who are of that age today and your own childhood and coming into adulthood? Sure. Um, in some ways, it's, it's every bit as scary now I think the nuclear threat uh, was more overt when I grew up. Um, although I think a lot of people now are in threat of uh, nuclear uh, war and a real denial uh, because it's 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 very threatening now. But the Cuban Missile Crisis was a, a, sp a very specific moment. But mm -hmm. growing up in the t in time of climate change. Uh, who knows what world p kids are going to grow up in. Uh, now, I personally, I got nine-year-old twins, so uh, I'm all for having kids. Uh, we, we need as many humans as we can get, and especially if, if we can get humans that are kind of care about the world, and I hope, I think my kids do, and, and, I, and I think their identity, and I've tried to uh, create uh, an atmosphere, and my wife too, where their identity is wrapped up in caring about the world. Hmm. Um, so I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't say don't have kids because of what's happening one way or the other. We have to try to uh, make what we can of human civilization. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I wondered if um, the fact that you had a background first going straight into the jobs market, being on kind of the ground floor as a worker, and also the fact that you have this kind of dual you have a dual citizenship. You're both. You spend a lot of time in Canada and the United States. Um, does that give you a little different perspective? Do you think on the the world of the news of the world of mainstream media? Uh, well, let me deal with the first one first because I think having worked, uh, you know, I I had two tracks available to me. Uh, if I'd stayed in school, uh, I came from an educated family. Uh, you know, not at all rich. My, you know, my, but you know, okay, and I, I could have gone to university. And, uh, you know, if whether it, had been, whether it had been filmmaking or something else, I, it wouldn't have been very difficult for me to go down a professional track. Uh, but because I quit school, I wound up working for the post office and working in the railroad. I didn't have professional jobs, at least then, available to me. And the, the working class culture is a completely different culture. Uh, it, it, people don't get it. If you haven't worked in a big factory, uh, you know, I worked in a punch press factory in Windsor and I worked on, the, you know, as I said, the railroad. And if you haven't worked in the working class, you do not get how different it is. Uh, I would say as much as there's a difference between the US and Canada, uh, the difference in culture between the working class and the middle and upper classes in Canada is, is perhaps more. Um, and it affects identity and everything else. So, so that gave me quite a different perspective. And then, yeah, sure. Uh, following U.S. politics and living for some time in the U.S. Uh, and getting a better handle. I mean, when I was in Canada, I would say the largest part of my Canadian identity was being anti-American. Right. Um, you know, the Vietnam War, uh, you know, I, I see people who are who, whose obsession in the US is attacking the Democratic Party. You know, and I've said to them, well, you're disillusioned because you were illusioned. You once thought the Democratic Party was something. And I grew up at a time where the Democratic Party was the party of war. They, you know, that was they were the Vietnam War Party, you know, until it was Nixon, but for a, a, during Johnson's time. Um, so living in the U.S. Uh, uh, changed my sense of Canadian identity, as well, also in terms of my political evolution. I became 
uh, less concerned about the Canadian part of my identity. I didn't adopt an American identity by any means, but I came less, beca have become uh, far less interested in national identity altogether. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's funny, I was just having this conversation with a young woman who works with me on the analysis, and I did an interview with a Ukrainian activist, and she didn't, she, she this, young woman I'm talking to, she really objected to something I said, uh, which I, I, I'm talking to uh, uh, Yulia Yurchenko, and, and I'm saying, why on earth would you fight and, and have people fight and lose their lives to keep uh, Donbass in Ukraine? I, I don't understand it. Is it. If the people of Donbass want to be part of Ukraine, well, then have a referendum. If the, if the Russians invade, well, then let them organize against the Russians. But why should thousands of people die for Ukrainian sovereignty? I don't mm. get it. Mm. You know, fight your own oligarchs. I, I'm not saying there isn't a time, you know, if, if some fascist external force, and there are some aspects of that to the Russian invasion. Sure. Um, you know, you have to defend from being in a police state. But to defend you know, the national identity. And I, and I said in the interview, I said, if the United States invaded Canada, uh, this Canada, not a progressive Canada, if they invaded Canada because you know, we had elected a really progressive government, okay, I'd fight for that. Right. But I wouldn't fight to defend this Canada. Go ahead and take us over <laughs> and make, it, make us a state and give us the same electoral college votes as California, and we'll get to decide who the president is. <laughs> I mean, my bigger concern is climate change. My bigger concern is nuclear war. And uh, to make a, a, a thing out of sovereignty, and, and it really hit me in this conversation with the Ukrainian activist. Sovereignty as it is, is very important when you own stuff. When you're a class that owns, you know, media or mines or this or that, and, and that being said, in Canada, the Americans already probably own more stuff than Canadians do. Right. Right. But, but, you know, th that kind of sovereignty, capitalist sovereignty matters to the elites because that's how you assert your ownership. Uh, if you work in a factory or, or, or even an office, uh, how different is it between in being in Toronto or being in New York? Um, so it's not that I don't value things about Canada, but should people in their thousands or tens of thousands die for that? No, maybe, you know, let's organize a general strike against the occupation. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a, like a, a total pacifist, but let's not die for the elites. Right, right. And so the, and, and you would say that the fact that you're, you had your own national identity dwindle as a, as a response to being involved in two different countries, perhaps gave you a perspective on national identity and the problems with it around the world? Would you say that that, that perspective comes from your own experience of, of having a dwindling national identity? I, I might have come to that conclusion anyway. In fact, maybe I kind of was, uh, because even the fact I moved to the US, because I just thought that's where, in terms of what I was doing in media, but politically, it was kind of more important because of you know, the importance of what goes on in the US. Um, so maybe I was already coming to those conclusions, but it, it, it pushed it further. Um, no, I, I think once you start to see things from the perspective of class, mm. uh, when you start to understand that the history of Canada is, is not a bunch of wise men that cared about the people, built railroads and built the country and, and created this wonderful country of equality and freedom and liberty, once you understand that that's bullshit, and the country was founded on, you know, genocide against native people, uh, and the, you know, the super exploitation of Chinese people to build the railroads and, and on and on. Um, and, and the role of Canada in terms of supporting US uh, imperialist adventures around the world. Uh, and on and on. Now, once you really start to get the history of Canada, then you have to think about, well, what is this nationalism? So I, I would say the deepest thing embedded in my psyche about nationalism was the Toronto Maple Leaf hockey team, and they did a good job of demolishing that, so I wasn't <laughs> left with much. <laughs>
<laughs> now, I, I, there's no doubt, you know, I have a certain, I, I'm from the Canadian people mm. and I have a, you know, a, a connection with that, that, that's that sort of part of my core of my psyche. Mm-hmm. But it's it's it, it ain't it ain't anything about this Canadian government or flag. Like I've, you know, I don't. I've told my kids they don't have to stand when they sing O Canada in school. And when we were in the U.S., I, I told my t- kids and the teachers, you know, I don't. If my kids don't want to, they're not standing and saying a pledge of allegiance. Uh, and I did that not only because I object to it, but I want the kids to think about well, what the heck is this? Pledge of allegiance to the flag and oh Canada, like, uh, you know what? What is it we're being asked to be loyal to? In some of the past interviews, we've talked a little about Canada's role, um, financiers being involved in, for instance, the the uh, coup in Chile, um, and of course, more recently, the Canadian government has been funneling weapons to the Saudi Arabian uh, government, committing genocide in Yemen. So this kind of idea of the, the perfect peacekeepers of Canada that sometimes gets propagated around the world really is pretty mythological um, and has been from, from its origins, as you were saying. Um, but I also wanted, wondered if some of the more positive aspects of, of Canada having, for instance, single payer health insurance and looking at how in the United States, of course, in the middle of a pandemic, even with the Democrats having total power, uh, not even getting a public option on, on their healthcare system. Um, do you look at those things and go, wow, this is some elements of the American system look particularly insane because of the Canadian perspective? Well, I, I think the thing to understand about the difference between the US and Canada is I think 80% of Canadians live in cities or very near big cities. We're very urbanized. Uh, yeah. About 10, 15 years ago, there was a very interesting study, I think, from Pew. Uh, comparing Canadian and American values and, and, and opinions about things. And the study came out and the title of, of it was two countries headed in different directions. Well, somebody went and had another look at the data and they compared American big cities to Canada and it was almost identical. Uh, it's, it's, it's the rural America uh, and, and the suburbs that are further away from the bigger cities in general they're the ones that have headed in a, in a really different direction. And, and to some extent, it's because of the destruction of the public education system. Um, it's the deindustrialization uh, because uh, given globalization. Um, it's the fact that the uh, money behind the Democratic Party, those section of the elites, never gave a damn about those people and didn't need them for a long time to win elections. And then when they did, it was too late. Um, so, so th- the real difference is is the urban rural split. I think uh, in attitudes. You go to New York, and honestly, there's there's certainly sections of New York and schools in New York that are better and more progressive than Toronto. Uh, I mean, Doug Ford wouldn't get elected in New York City. Of course, he wouldn't get elected in Toronto either. Uh, it's rural. Rural Ontario plays a, a similar role. Perhaps there is some some degree to which the the analysis of Canada versus the United States is more something that is um, uh, you could say it's manufactured in a particular direction, or we just aren't looking at the role that big money plays uh, as and putting everything on the people when it's not necessarily a difference between people. It's it can be power structures, it can be the the different districts, as you say, and who's got the money and who's got the power in a given circumstance. Yeah, like we have health, you know, we we have single payer health care. And I, I mean, at being anti American and having single payer payer health care, you, you know, often gets described as being the Canadian identity. Yeah. Um, but the fact is, uh, what is it? I think it's one in one in five kids in Toronto live in poverty. Uh, the hospitals are terribly underfunded now. The schools are underfunded. Uh, like the, my kids' elementary school, they, they don't have a librarian anymore. They don't have an art teacher. Uh, you know, this, we lived in New York for a few months and they had an art teacher and a librarian in their New York school. Uh, the, uh, so even with single pair, uh, but, but generally speaking, we are more for socialized solutions, generally speaking, 
But as I say, I think that's an urban phenomenon more, more than almost anything. Uh, if Canada had a, as, as strong a rural vote, uh, well, that's how, as I said, we got Doug Ford. And, and you even take the war in Iraq. Uh, if Quebec hadn't been so against Canada's participation in the war in Iraq, and if you just went on Canadian public opinion, we would have joined in on the war in Iraq. It, it was Quebec that kept us out for, and, uh, for, and they have their own reasons. But, uh, but the basic problem is that the decay of capitalism, global monopoly capitalism, the parasitism of it mm -hmm. um, is, is in an advanced stage. It's an, it, there's no country immune to it. And then the number one issue right now is, is the climate crisis. And Canada is a great criminal on this front. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Canada is one of the worst actors on, on the global climate stage. So, you know, what, what, what's our nationalism about when it comes to that? Uh, you know, and again, I don't blame, you know, it, it is about structures uh, and systems, but as Canadians, if we want to talk about a distinct Canadian identity, we better take face up and live up to who we are in terms of climate. Your work in media has always had both a focus on what's happening right now, and then what is a systemic critique? You, you always look at the environment in which these, these actions are taking place. It's not just, and this, and this, and this. Uh, was there a point in which you realized that you needed both of those things to make sense of the world? Boy, a point. Um... Yeah, reading Marx, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Marx did the same thing. Marx used to write for a, a newspaper in New York, right. one, one of the most widely read papers in New York. In fact, I think it was the number one paper in New York. And he used to do commentary on events with, you know, historical materialism, with historical analysis and, you know, from the point of view of class. Um, and if you want people to understand the underlying principles of how to understand class in the world, um, you really have to enter it through people's experience and the events around them. And that's exactly what Marx did. I mean, Marx analyzed things as they were happening, whether it was, you know, the Paris Commune or you name it, uh, and gave it, uh, is in the context of that, he gave the historical analysis. I mean, you know, the thing I've been kind of intrigued with in trying to explain this to, so people can get it is that how does any individual understand who they are as a person if you don't get how the society came into being? Because clearly when you're a baby, one, you don't get to choose where you're born. You don't get to choose what class, what family, what country. You know, you're born into a set of cir existing circumstances that shape you. Um, and, and, and of course, media plays a big role in that shaping. But if you don't understand how that society came into being, then how on earth can you understand yourself? So the un, unpeeling away and trying to understand who I am, I'm peeling away the layers of uh, identity that are simply false. Uh, and inconsistent with the actual historical experience. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's one of the great crimes, if you want, it's not, you know, of, of me, mainstream media and the school system is that there's practically no understanding of history. And to the extent that there is, it's, it's a ridiculously at best superficial narrative. And from a you know, class point of view, uh, well, there isn't. Well, there is a class point of view, obviously. It's the narrative of the elites, but uh, they would never own up to that. Right. I, I, one of the things that sets your work apart, I think, from a lot of the other outlets, not just in terms of big corporate media, but also a lot of the stuff that we see in so-called independent media, which sometimes can be more corporate than the corporate media. Um, you actually go into a lot of the people who are major game changers, who get almost no focus. We tend to focus on celebrity politicians and pundits, but a lot of the big movers and shakers are actually people like Bill Black or Bob Moses 
people who are working on nonprofits, community activists, people who uh, prosecute white collar criminals, people who do research and shape policy. Um, and you do in-depth conversation with these people who understand the issues in a way that is so much more hands-on than almost anything I see on other media outlets. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your general philosophy of how you delve into the issues, who you look to delve into the issues with, and, and where, you're, where you, you try and find your starting points? Well, I have a, a kind of ongoing thing in my head of trying to analyze the world. Mm. And from the point of view of trying to communicate what are the key points of change and hopefully help some people understand it. Uh, and, and a lot of my interviews are probably too in depth and too long for a lot of people, but uh, it, it helps work out the analysis, and then I can try to popularize it in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but my own curiosity leads me. Uh, so like with Bill Black, uh, I, you know, his, his, his historical experience of prosecuting white collar crime um, is great fleshing out of how this system engenders such corruption and criminality yeah. but i don't think he and i've gone after him on this i don't think he actually answers why is this corruption systemic yeah. um and and be and and, the, and he's you know he's still i don't know if still but he did always think certain kinds of laws could be passed that would mitigate uh, wall street crime and and banking fraud Right. Uh, but you have to ask, well, okay, but why aren't they being passed? And why is it even the laws that exist are barely implemented? Right. And, and it always boils down to the question of who owns stuff. You got to get into the evolution of, of ownership and how, as we produce, people relate to things. And as long and, and you know, once you have such concentration of ownership, and you get thus such concentration of political power. Well, of course you can't pass any laws that are actually effective. Now you used to have uh, for a time, and then this is, I guess, FDR and the New Deal is most associated with this, a section of capital that saw that you really do have to restrain its excesses if you want the system to survive. Um, that voice, of, of you could say capitalist systemic reason um, has been greatly greatly marginalized to the point that almost doesn't exist uh, to the point where they are facing catastrophic climate crisis that is going to demolish their own system you know they thought they had uh, global supply chain problems during the pandemic imagine what those supply chains are going to look like when hundreds of millions of people from the south are trying to move north. Within 10, 15, 20 years, whole sections of the globe are going to be unlivable. It's not even in the discourse. There are, you know, the IPCC report, which I'm told by a lot of the scientists, even some who were involved, is quite conservative in its predictions. But the predictions were apocalyptic. And those are conservative. Uh, there's a report just came out a, a, a couple of weeks ago. In the next five years, there's a, at least 50-50 chance, and maybe better, that at least one of those five years, we are already going to hit 1.5 degrees global warming above the uh, industrial pre-industrial average. Right. Like in five years. It, by, by 2033, and, and this, again, may be uh, wrong, we will hit 1.5 across or as the global average. Well, 1.5 is a disaster. I mean, look at the heat waves now in India and Pakistan and the flooding and forest fires in North, in North America and all around the world. And we're only at 1.2 global average. So imagine what 1.5, and people are talking about 1.5 will be, oh, that's okay. The, not only is 1.5 not okay, uh, 1.5 is you're on the way to two. 
and you probably aren't going to be able to stop it. Um, so, so, you know, we're, the, sort of these existential threat facing us and the media is where um, this is beyond a level of corruption. And if we look at it just as a question of corruption, you can't get at what real solutions look like. And, and here, let me tie these two things together. Great. Can you imagine a solution to the climate crisis without central planning? It's pretty hard. Is the marketplace absolutely on its own, obviously, and it hasn't, but obviously is not going to deal with the climate crisis without central planning uh, and, and public uh, assertion of public interest. It's obvious we're not going to deal with it. This, so this, this goes beyond a question of that the system's kind of okay, but there's corrupt actors that need to be restrained mm. uh, in every field, but with climate being the most critical, although I have to add nuclear weapons to that too, because it's a very similar story. Um, this, this class that's in power is beyond dealing with these things because as individuals, their identities and their how they earn their living, they are locked into this uh, silo that money making is what life's about. Yes, the world's probably going to shit. We'll probably be okay because of our money. There's nothing much we can do about it anyway. So the hell with it. Let's make money and enjoy it and make sure at least my kids will probably be okay. And my, who knows what happens to grandchildren and great grandchildren. Uh, the cynicism is insane. And that's the operative word here. It is we're at a point where this kind of capitalism is at the level of insane. And, and you know, uh, Ellsberg, when it comes to nuclear weapons, he calls it institutional madness. It's a reflection of a stage of capitalism, where the system is completely in chaos. At a time because of artificial intelligence and digitization, an individual enterprise like Amazon can be beautifully organized. And we have the capacity to have a beautiful, rational, organized society. Instead, we have beautiful individual enterprises that make a shitload of money and a society that may come to an end. Well, that's that you put it pretty bluntly there. Um, I, I wonder if we could look at how independent media, in your view, what should independent media be doing? What questions and topics should independent media be covering that we're not seeing from the mainstream right now? If we are to have a, a movement of voices like your own uh, with those kinds of concerns, what should we be trying to draw attention towards that the mainstream is just not doing right now? Well, this is what I'm kind of struggling with, which is... Um... To a large extent, it's more a problem of distribution, uh, at least for me. Um, and by distribution, I mean, how do you get uh, working people, or even elites to that, for that matter, uh, but who, who, who would never come across these kinds of ideas, who never hear any of this analysis? whether they're listening to CNNs or they're listening to Fox, um, all they, you know, or in Canada, the CBC for that matter, um, uh, all they hear is this conventional elite narrative. Um, yeah, they hear the odd thing about climate's dangerous and then let's go on to the next topic. Um, that's the most important question. Now, the, the, the for alternative media, and I'm trying to figure out how I can do this for what I'm doing, we have to try to be more connected with the kind of organizing that's going on where people go around knocking on doors. Mm. Um, the, uh, that's the only way to break through the monopoly of the distribution system. Um, like on U YouTube is uh, people, everyone thinks they're shadow banning us on YouTube. Uh, since I did my reports on January 6th um, and our numbers went way down, but even if they were up, uh, it's still a very, very tiny sliver of people that kind of already agree with you that watch 
or people that love to fight with you to watch, but you know, ordinary <laughs> people aren't. But when you pick a community and you start to organize and you start knocking on doors and not just during some election campaign, but to build an ongoing movement, um, that's what it, we have to kind of connect more with if we, to, to, in terms of change amongst ordinary people. Um, and, and hopefully if one can connect the kind of work like a, that I'm trying to do with people that are organizing in that way, um, it, it's a way to get people to pay more attention. I, I mean, in terms of format, what I do is not conducive, except for people that are really interested because you know, it's long form, it's, it's in-depth analysis. But as I said, it helped once you get the deeper analysis, then you can start to uh, synthesize it and, 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 and get at ways to explain it um, more quickly. Um, but I'm a one man band practically. I have you know, one person helping me uh, and another person helps me on the website. And, um, but I'm a little, uh, I, I don't think a lot's gonna come out of this internet stuff. The, and, and the problem for a lot of alternative media, a little less so for myself now, because one of the va virtues of being so small is I don't have to raise a ton of money. Right. And you know the donations I get now is enough to be sustainable. But if you're trying to make money out of this or you have to worry about a, a bigger operation, then breaking through is so dependent on your brand and, and how you're seen as social media. And the more you fight with people, the, d the better you do. And, right. And, right. And, it, and the economic model is not conducive to uh, media that's connected to real organizing amongst ordinary people. Hmm. Like I, I had the thing, I was gonna, a few years ago, I was gonna make a film, I was starting to research uh, it was going to be called Why Do They Hate Us? And I was going to take families that had lost people in 9-11 and I was going to take them to Pakistan and Afghanistan and let them go around asking people, why do you hate us? Because that's what they kept asking. And I interviewed this one guy who was a fire chief who, who was actually in charge of a bunch of firefighters at 9-11 and his son was killed in one of the buildings. <laughs> and I talked to him and he had organized Democrats for Bush after 9-11. And I started telling him about the history of 9-11, uh, history of Afghanistan. He had no idea the CIA had invited bin Laden to Afghanistan. I mean, asked the Saudis to send somebody and knew nothing of the, his jaw just dropped. Uh, the, the, the lack of understanding and knowing of actual history amongst people is profound. So how do we find a way to, you know, connected with organizing on the ground, knocking on doors, and creating media that's easy for people to consume. And I'm not claiming I'm doing that yet. Sure. Um, I hope my Ellsberg, I'm doing this documentary with Ellsberg about nuclear weapons, and I hope that is something like that. Mm -hmm. That's No, that's, I mean, we have to kind of lay out the issues and you're, you're absolutely right that this focus on, uh, on people at the grassroots level is absent from almost any form of media right now. There's really only the people who are reaching out at that level, at a brand level, at a marketing level, not so much on an activism level. Uh, and you're right, that may be the challenge for independent media moving forward. That may be the task, that might be the quest. Yeah, I did a, uh, I'd really recommend people watch this. I did a series of interviews with Jane McAlevey, who's a union organizer. Mm -hmm. And she distinguishes between um, advocacy and organizing. You know, advocacy is when you get people who kind of already agree with you to go do something. And a lot of the alternative media is in that space. Uh, organizing is when you, you know, go directly to people who mostly probably don't agree with you. And you get them involved in a struggle, whether it's building a union or electing somebody who's progressive, dealing with the issues facing them. And in the course of that, uh, you, you try to raise people's uh, awareness of the bigger issues. Um, the, the problem is the economic model of either trying to raise money online, going to donors, big donors, foundations, all of that economic model creates a, a kind of media that's not very connected with organizing. Right. 
I would love to delve into this a lot further, but um, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask you to perhaps identify some of the, the interviews you think give uh, an alternative perspective that, that you have been, that you have produced through the analysis that people will, if they see it, uh, really get a kind of refreshing point of view. What would you say would be some of the key interviews that you would first recommend people start with if they were to turn to the analysis for the first time? <laughs> That's a hard one because I have no memory anymore. <laughs> um, well, the, the climate stuff, although I, I, people that are into the issue will, will probably know that, but uh, one of the ones I did with Peter Carter, looking at the most recent IPCC report, um, you know, we're, we're so near the precipice of the end of organized human society. And it, it, it just is not in people's normal daily awareness. I think that our take uh, on Ukraine and, and the Russian invasion, um, there's people in some of the alternative media that are extremely apologetic uh, uh, for the Russians. And I'm, I'm actually astounded at how successful the Russian propaganda operation has been and very well uh, planned through the development of RT and the way they kept inviting the American left onto RT to critique uh, the United States. Uh, it created a whole space and net and web of people uh, imbued with this kind of vision of uh, the Russian state as almost something progressive because RT let the American left. Now, I mean, Russian television didn't let the Russian left on TV. And right. in, in Europe, uh, you know, the Russia, Putin was very encouraging, and Marine Le Pen and other, the far right uh, in Europe. But in the US, all, you know, they can make themselves look progressive because they put progressives on TV. Um, but we've been, we're not the only ones, but I think we've been very clear that this, the, the invasion has to be looked at as a as a piece of global monopoly capitalism. And uh, while the US, you know, imperialism is a global system, and while US imperialists have committed war crimes on a scale, no one can even approach. Um, that doesn't mean that countries that are monopoly capitalists, which Russia is, doesn't have their own ambitions. And I've, you know, I've said on air a few times, listen, if Canada could be the global hegemon, our elites would jump at it. Uh, they just, that's not the cards that they were dealt. You know, they got to be second banana to the US. I, I, I mean, people can explore the interviews. It's hard for me just to come up with one here and there. But the, the main thing is this is to try to approach this. Uh, I mean, I do commentaries some like this too. I get interviewed. Uh, um, people could look at those. Um, the take on January 6, I think was interesting, uh, which, you know, one of the things I've been working at, which is not much in media anywhere, uh, is the role of Christian nationalism. And the effect, extent of which Christian nationalism has infiltrated the American military, but also Canadian, um, and it's it's a it's a very uh, uh, poisonous movement. It, it's it, this is the movement around Trump, right. and they're the ones that made Trump president, including specifically Robert Mercer, the billionaire, uh, who's involved in Christian nationalism, right. and uh, so you know, the, it was the lead up to January 6th and the, and the uh, possibility of the Christian nationalists in the military helping stage a coup. Um, I think we're, that's the one YouTube went after us on. If it wasn't for Matt Taibbi writing an article exp attacking YouTube for clo trying to close us down, they would have, I think. But they back. I remember up. that it was the, so. So that was really the turning point for it. It was you were pretty much shut down by YouTube on that. Uh, yeah, until, uh, eventually they had to back up because Taibi has such a big following, and he was going to really critique YouTube. And so when he contacted them, they said, "Oh, it was a mistake. It was a mistake," and they put two of the stories back up. Um, but after that, our our numbers went down significantly, and and that's where the shadow banning comes in. Um, Anyway, I, I think all the interviews are good. 
people can explore the uh you know i've got some stuff with dan ellsberg up there and yes and uh uh i'm really looking forward to I, I would say i, I shall say the larry wilkerson interviews are really good yes they're extremely enlightening i have found those extremely beneficial yes well paul i'm i know i've 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 kept you over time much over time and i have a tendency to do that but it, you have so much uh, you have so much knowledge and you have so much experience and I'm really privileged to get to, to pick your brain on these issues for a while. Um, it's been a real treat. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks very much for asking.